Huffman. I'm the marketing director of Miles Franklin Precious Metals. We're one of the largest bullion dealers here in the States and have been for 26 years. Uh, my background is I'm a, uh, you know, I was a financial analyst for 15 plus years, a chartered financial analyst. Worked. I'm from New York. I worked on Wall Street for, for 15 years or so, and then I moved on to the mining industry where I worked for five years, and now I've been four years here at Miles Franklin uh, writing a free blog, doing podcasts, audio casts, and, and marketing precious metals. Um, basically, when I was on Wall Street and uh, I worked buy side, sell side, you name it, the majority of actually my work was in the uh, oil field service and uh, energy sector. Um, you know, I kind of became a whistleblower of sorts. I left Wall Street in 2005 uh, because the conflict of interest was just it made me sick. And of course, those are the good old days compared to where we are today. And, uh, you know, and uh, back in 2003, I was already fully invested, or 2002, I was fully invested in precious metals and I've been writing free missives to the world, uh, first on my own and now through Miles Franklin since 2002 or three. Uh, back then, I was a research analyst on the equity side and I was basically told constantly by my bankers, compliance officers, what to write, what to say. Uh, we had several scandals that were very well known at, at Solomon Smith Barney where I was working, like uh, Enron and WorldCom, mm -hmm. uh, among others. Uh, but, you know, and it was mostly the conflict of interest from our investment bankers, which was making it very difficult for me to wake up every day. And, um, you know, and so I kind of morphed, I've reinvented myself as someone who, who uh, you know, who speaks the truth on blogs about what really happens on Wall Street and how the economy really works, what economic data really means, and uh, and and how and how markets are manipulated, and in the goal of trying to help people do what I've been doing personally, which is to trade out of these fiat currencies, which are being rapidly destroyed en route to complete destruction, uh, in lieu of real money, gold and silver, the only assets throughout five thousand years of history which have preserved value. Well, when I say Wall Street, I mean the global financial industry, um, particularly in Europe. I mean, London invented the crimes of, of, of the banking uh, system and basically taught it to us, and we are now the best at it. But you see it everywhere. You see the People's Bank of China. You see what's going in the Bank of Japan. And you see all the central banks in the world who are all competing to destroy their currencies in what I call the final currency war, which really is just... It's just, in a, it's just an effort to maintain the status quo, a status quo in which the top top of, uh, of, the, of the chain, the bankers and politicians that run the country, uh, get, you know, get to fleece everyone else of all their wealth. And Wall Street is just part of the mechanism. You know, central banks are the key to it uh, because they're the ones who print the money, but their partners on Wall Street are the ones who funnel the money, you know, launder and funnel the money throughout the system. And, uh, you know, and... and you know, so basically, Wall Street is a microcosm of the macrocosm of the banking system in general. Well, that's right. So, what you're saying there is that we're going through a period of the of, of the greatest transfer of wealth the world has ever seen. Is that a fair assumption? Well, yes. I mean, the wealth disparity that this causes. Again, there's so many ramifications of what they do. They print money. They buy the stock market. They think that it's going to cause a wealth effect and part of what it, what it actually does is yes the stock market goes up uh, but you know we've had we now have because of the economic deformation all the debt that's been created all the the oversupply capacity in the economies the competition around the world we now have an economy that's so bad that people no longer can participate in the stock market in fact most of the people in the world if they didn't lose their shirt in the, the whole 2000 tech wreck they certainly did in the whole 2008 uh, collapse, whether it was in housing or stocks, the point where no one can even own, st to think there'd be a wealth effect when no one owns stocks anymore is comical. For instance, CNBC, which I call the Pied Piper of, of the financial world, you know, because they're the number one financial media station, they've been around since 1991 or 92, and, and I think it was just last week or two weeks ago, as the Dow was hitting its all-time high, and as the NASDAQ was exceeding its, its mania, 1999 highs, CNBC was hitting its all-time low rating. Yep. Again, people are not listening anymore. They're not watching the mainstream news. They're not reading uh, Reuters and Bloomberg anymore. They're not reading Yahoo Finance. They're not reading uh, the, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times. They're reading the alternative uh, that on the internet, like what we're doing here to get their news. And they're not paying attention to the reality uh, of, of, um, of financial markets that are rigged. Uh, that have nothing to do with, real, with, with economic reality. Here in the States, as I said, 
they crow about this housing recovery. Again, they just say the word recovery, recovery, recovery. The Fed says recovery, even though we just had our worst GDP report in, in, that I can even remember. I mean, it's negative. We're, we're, we're going down and we're still supposed to be recovering. Uh, we just had our worst trade deficit ever, but we're recovering. Just because they say the word recovery doesn't mean that we're recovering. Uh, but again, if you actually look at the, quote, housing market, which, by the way, here has already rolled over, it's topped. It's all been in the high end of the market, which is no different than saying you're in New York or London, which is where all the free money went. They gave it to London bankers, so London bankers have used that money to bid up property prices in London, yep. but not in the rest of England. That's why you have an election next week, and there's a lot of uncertainty. It's not like everyone loves Cameron saying you're doing such a great job. That's why you have record low approval ratings everywhere, France, Spain, Italy, the United States. Actually, you're talking about Spain. I haven't even looked at the numbers recently, but aside from the fact that they're that you know that Catalonia, which is a quarter of the country, wants to secede. Uh, you know, right last I looked, the Spanish housing market prices hadn't even ticked up yet, or barely moved from the bottoms of 2008. So whether people are buying property or not, the market is as bad as it's been, and the economy is as is as bad as it's been. Today, the PMI data for Europe came out flat as a board, going nowhere for Europe. Yep. So there, you know, and meanwhile the debt keeps rising, and the currency has now just crashed thanks to the ECB, which means the cost of living of everyone from the UK to Italy and Spain is going to just keep going up. Yeah, you've had an unprecedented financial boon from the quantitative easing in London. Yep. So naturally, the housing market in London is going up. And again, if you look without knowing it, I guarantee if you look at it, you'll see it's not all of London. It's primarily the high end of London. The average person hasn't seen anything. Uh, what I've seen here in Colorado is my house hasn't gone up in price in eight years, and my, they just raised my property taxes last week. That, and now rates are starting to go up everywhere. That's the big news here. Rates are going up in Europe. Any slight increase in rates is going to destroy everything. I remember. This is with the ECB just starting QE, whatever you want to call it. Just last month, they started in March. They're going to do it for 20 months, 1.2 trillion euros. And yet, rates are now higher in a lot of Europe than they were when they started. They are now, no, I'm just looking. I just looked at a chart yesterday in different countries. In France, they are higher than when the announcement was made. In Germany, they're moving back up to that rate. In every country, it's different. But, I mean, look, the German 10-year yield has doubled this week. This week. So, again... Rates are not much lower than they were before QE was, was announced. And all that money has done is destroyed the euro further. And if rates keep going up, which they certainly at some point must, you can't have record high money printing and, and record high debt without interest rates going up. It will destroy any semblance of this fake so-called recovery, even in the high end of the market for houses and certainly in stocks. No PPT is going to be able to keep the stock market up with interest rates rising. That's the, the whole basis of this bubble is to keep rates down to record levels. They hit 5,000-year lows, and now they're moving back up again. And the only way to keep them down is going to be to increase QE, which is only going to increase inflation and cause... I mean, my, here's my point. Something is going to give soon because the whole Ponzi scheme is in its terminal stage right now. It's not like by keeping it going, like... If we don't have a collapse next week, that means all is well. No. I mean, look at the economic data. I mean, what more do I have to say? The United States just reported the most horrific GDP, the most horrific trade deficit. And this is the United States. You know, we're the best. We've decoupled. This is the United States. The rest of the world, dead to the world. Europe's economy has been flat for years. F that. Their debt has exploded. They're, they're, they're printing money like crazy. I mean... How much it, it the current? I mean, when you talk about the euro crashing like it has, and Europe, Europe is a net importer continent, it has a huge negative effect on the economy and on the cost of living of, of the hundreds of millions of people using it. How much longer can you keep that from collapsing? And if you don't, it doesn't matter. It's just getting worse. It's getting worse. The fact that we don't have a 2008 style crash tomorrow doesn't mean that things aren't getting worse because they are with each passing day. It's, it's human nature to try to deny especially if you don't have the means. It's like people say, well, why aren't people buying gold? Because most people have no savings. So yeah. the last thing you want to do is believe it's a hopeless situation. Of course you want to believe what the government tells you, especially if the government's going to promise you entitlements. Uh, so, you know, most people aren't going to do anything. And for the mo you know, most people don't have the ability to do anything. But, you know, what do I tell people? If you have the means to do something, well, do something. And, I, you know, I wrote an article a few years ago called Protection Continuum which says for everyone, it's different what they believe is best, you know, how they can protect themselves. I say like a zero on a scale one to 10 is 
move into Manhattan and put all your cash in Citibank. And a 10 is move to a desert island, bury gold in the sand and forage for food. So again, you have all different kinds of choices, but the fact is, for God's sakes, embrace the reality that your own life is probably telling you. Certainly your cost of living, likely your business prospects, unless you're an investment banker getting free money uh, from the government, and do something about it. Do something to protect yourself. Buy some gold, uh, downsize, uh, you know, have some, some backup contingency plans, have some food around. Just be ready for things getting worse because there's a reason, you know, that social unrest is exactly what I'm talking about. The, the wealth disparity is so great and people have so little that they are angry and, uh, and they're fighting back. Uh, you know, they are increasingly militant and vigilant or militant when, uh, when authority is telling them what to do. Whether things are true or not, I don't know, but, you know, there's a, a, a major conspiracy theory camp in our world yeah. or camps that believe that there are groups out there that are planning all these things. And I have said all along, there's just no way. From Occam's razor perspective alone, meaning the simplest explanation is, is the most likely. Look, we have a, a global fiat currency system. Every country has got a global fiat currency. Every country has leadership. And every one of those leaderships wants to stay in power. And so they do everything they can to do it. And occasionally they meet and discuss things. But for the most part, they're just trying to survive. And, and no, there is no movement east. In fact, I would bet that 99% of the most powerful people in the West have never spoken to any of the most powerful people in the East. They don't even speak the, the same language. They certainly don't have the same goals, either short term or long term. No, what's going on is there's a natural progression toward the East that's a secular trend over time. Uh, you know, they, they have more people, uh, so they realize that they can produce things more cheaply and their government realized that they needed to, to be more capitalistic to get the business over there. And so that money, that money, that those jobs, that business has gone there permanently. It's never going back. In fact, we aided them because our corporate titans uh, lobbied the government to make all these trade agreements, which which expedited the the movement of those jobs that would have gone uh, there oh, either way. Plus, the East, being the early uh, the earliest users of fiat currency, are the most knowledgeable about how destructive it is, which is why. They've been buying gold hand over fist, and they understand that it's real money as opposed to, heck, America's only been around for two, 200 years. China's been around for thousands of years. Uh, so, no, there's just a natural movement of power from West to East, but it's not because people are making decisions. It's just happening, and it's going to happen. And, you know, pick a date 50 years from now, it's going to be laughable that we're sitting here worried about what the Fed says and the Bank of England and Mario Draghi and IMF. No, these will not be important. They'll be around. But they won't be important in the big scheme of things. Uh, China will be running, running the world or leading the, the block that runs the world 50 years from now. Uh, but it's not going to be that the world goes away. It's just going to be, as you said, we here in the States, for instance, because we've had this uh, reserve currency, have had the highest standard of living. And uh, we are going to have the biggest fall from our standard of living. And China is going to have the biggest rise from its incredibly low standard of living. Okay, so um, the rumors of war, you don't feel that we're moving towards a war? Oh, I, I absolutely do. Uh, only, if only because history says that's what happens. You know, when empires crumble, there's wars, and it's many empires. The United States some Empire, uh, the European Empire, the Japanese Empire. Uh, people are angry, and they're looking for scapegoats, and governments are certainly always looking for ways to increase their resources and to, and to, uh, and to you know, rally the people. So that's why you're seeing a tremendous amount of, of uprisings and potential wars everywhere, from the Middle East to the Ukraine, Japan and, and China. I mean, you look everywhere, these things are, are, are going on. I mean, it would be hard to believe we can get through what I believe will be the most painful financial retrenchment in generations, I mean, perhaps centuries, without war. We just hope for the best and prepare for the worst. Okay, so if, say I've got a, a pot of... Um, um, money and I'm looking to uh, protect that wealth. Would I look for property? Would I invest in gold and silver? You know, and if I did go down the gold and silver route, how would I do that? All right, and again, it's this protection continuum. What do you feel most protected? I mean, I certainly wouldn't be buying real estate uh, for investment if I was worried about a crash. I mean, look what happened to real estate in 2008. Look what it's, what's happening in Spain with real estate. It's still near its lows. This is after the recovery. Think of where it's going to be in Spain after, you know, we have the, the next leg down starts, let alone if rates start going up here. So again, you know, you just have to determine for yourself what's safe. For me personally, 
I have my house, uh, and uh, which I live in. I don't intend to move. I didn't buy it for investment. And I have physical gold and silver. I have enough cash to pay the bills. I keep it out of the banking system. And uh, whenever I can, I buy gold and silver at these subsidized rates below the cost of production. That's me personally. Uh, but I can't speak for everyone else. But I can say, but to just sit there and hold your euros when they have negative interest rates uh, and, they're, uh, and they're deciding to destroy the currency um, while the economy is falling apart and all these nations are threatening to break apart, well, you know, suit yourself. But for me, I'm going to go for real money, uh, gold and silver. And to, and to buy, it's very easy. Certainly here in the States, it is. Just call us at 800-822-8080. Email me at ahoffman at milesfranklin.com. It's as simple as any retail transaction there is. In Europe, it's probably pretty simple as well, and we can help you too. Right, so you can assist us in Europe, is that correct? Of course, and we have a world-class storage program uh, in Canada that, you know, that we've spent a lot of time on. Uh, we certainly can uh, export, uh, export. We can certainly send gold to just about anywhere in Europe. It's not really a problem. Uh, of course, you have VAT taxes there, so depending where you live, it may not be feasible, but That's some places it is. Yeah. Okay, so, so uh, when buying gold and silver, you would suggest store it in a storage area rather than physically holding it in your hands? Uh, no, actually, I don't, want to, I don't want to give that impression. What, what I'm saying is we do have that option. For, for pretty much, I would put it this way, I would say 99% of the people in the world that own gold or silver, whether it's jewelry or coins, own it on, keep it in their house or where they know it. I mean, they don't own enough of it that it matters. Uh, and, uh, you know, but that's only a few percent of the world's gold. The majority of the world's gold is, is owned by a handful, you know, like sovereign banks and countries and very wealthy individuals. So for them, they obviously have to store it somewhere. Uh, now, there's always some people in between that for various reasons, it would make sense. In my case, of course, it makes sense. I'm a very high profile owner of gold and silver. So when I'm talking every day and writing about owning it, I certainly can't be keeping it at home. So for me, it makes sense. And then there are for people who are, let's say you're a renter or an expatriate or someone who moves around a lot, or you simply have too much to store, especially if it's silver, it would make sense for you to hold it somewhere offshore. I mean, uh, in a storage facility, whether it's offshore or not. For those people, we offer some very uh, unique opportunities, particularly our Brinks program in Montreal, uh, which I think is the world's best. If you're interested in that, we can help you with that. Uh, we have programs also in the States and other places. I wouldn't use them at all. I wouldn't touch, I wouldn't store gold in the States if you paid me. And, um, you know, but for most people, just try to keep it at home. Don't, you know, tell only people on a need to know basis. If possible, have it in a nice safe, hidden. Guns, dogs, alarms are all great. But, uh, you know, if you do have, have an interest in storing it, uh, we can certainly help you. And there are other options around the world as well. Okay, so in times of war, would you consider the, the possibility that governments will um, uh, take by force the gold and the silver? Do you think that's a possibility? Well, yes. It's a guarantee that governments will take draconian actions all the time. I mean, here in the States, uh, during 2008, they were actively discussing in Congress the confiscation of IRAs. That's why it's so ridiculous that people haven't all taken them out. You know, as soon as they, they printed money, got the markets up, they stopped talking about it and they talk about the next crisis. But when things get bad enough, that's what they do. Now, as far as like, if you talk about it here in the States, are they going to confiscate gold? Ridiculous. I mean, this is not 1930. It's a global market. If they said tomorrow, well, we're going to confiscate gold, the price of gold would overnight go to $10,000 an ounce and, no, and it would be like a collapsing currencies, including the dollar. But atop that, you know, they don't do these things in a vacuum, as you said. They only do it in response to crises. And I, you know, I get these questions all the time, these uh, what-if questions, I call them. Like, what if they confiscate? What if this? What if they make it a, a windfall tax? What if they say it'll a 90% tax to use gold or whatever? I say, look, I wrote priceless, priceless precious metals are worthless dollars a few years ago. It basically says all these things happen during a crisis. The only way they'd even consider something that stupid would be if the dollar had already crashed, at which point you'd be happy, you'd be thrilled to have your contraband gold because, of course, a black market would, be, would, be, would occur as it has in India yeah. uh, right now. And, you know, how are they going to get your gold anyway? And, and, again, the people of America, for instance, don't have any gold. Well, what gold? I mean, the U.S. has trillions and trillions, tens of trillions, hundreds of trillions of liabilities. They've already clearly leased or swapped out all the gold they have. The American people have almost no gold. Yeah. 
certainly no silver. So how how are they even gonna, how would it even matter if they can get all of it? So again, you can't worry about these things. You buy gold and silver because you know it will preserve your purchasing power when everything else is collapsing. And then you worry about other stuff down the road. And believe me, if you get in a situation where governments, let alone the U.S. government, the paragon of, of freedom and independence is, is, is saying stuff like that, it may not even be a world you want to live in.